This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 121. The Read to Lead podcast is brought to you by FreshBooks, offering a month of unrestricted use totally free right now, and you don't need a credit card for the trial. To claim your free month, go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. That's freshbooks.com slash read to lead. It's not that the companies that scrapped the annual performance review just did away with all feedback entirely. They just realized that what managers really needed was some advice on how to coach people to give them constant feedback. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Hi, and welcome to the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth, where the topic of leadership is always central to our discussion, but we also dig into things like personal development, productivity, career, business, marketing, and entrepreneurship. We're sticking with business and management specifically in today's episode, as you and I will be joined momentarily by David Burkus, author of Under New Management, How Leading Organizations Are Upending Business as Usual. I'll ask David about things like what's wrong with email and why should we reconsider how we use it at work, how sharing salaries openly can actually increase productivity, can unlimited vacation time policies really work, and a lot more. I ran into my friend and fellow business owner, Chris, at church the other day, and he was asking me how things were going with the podcast. And I started telling him about the new sponsorship from FreshBooks and asked if he had ever used FreshBooks before in his business. Well, Chris went on for several minutes about how much he loved uh, FreshBooks. In fact, it was Chris who gave me the idea to talk to listeners on the show about FreshBooks. So, Chris... What is it you like so much about FreshBooks? It helped me get organized. I was spending way too much time on invoicing, and I went from a couple hours a day to maybe just a couple of minutes. Wow, that's fantastic. I mean, I can see instantly how much in receivables I had coming in each each account, and also because the customers could log in and see their own accounts uh, on their own, they could as well. My customers loved it. Uh, they didn't have to bother me and discover <laughs> what's outstanding or see a copy of the invoice because they could just go online and do it all themselves. Um, the amazing thing about it was that I got paid on average two weeks sooner. It seems crazy to think that, but yeah. I think because everything was digital, the invoices went out sooner and the customers also paid sooner. It was so easy. I don't know why I waited so long to start using it. Anything else you want to add about uh, your experience? Um, if you were starting out and looking for a, a service to kind of keep you organized and keep your customers organized, uh, this is absolutely the best service that I've seen and, and been a part of. Don't miss those key points. You want to get paid faster, right? FreshBooks accounting software helps you make that process so much easier, not only for yourself, but for your customer. Thanks, Chris. FreshBooks is offering a month of unrestricted use right now, totally free, and you don't need a credit card for the trial. To claim your free month, go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash read to lead. David Burkus is a best-selling author, an award-winning podcaster, and a management professor. He is a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Bloomberg, Business Week, and the Financial Times. He's a popular corporate speaker and has consulted companies of all kinds, from startups to Fortune 500 companies. David is the author of The Myths of Creativity, The Truth About How Innovative Companies and People Generate Great Ideas, and he is also the author of the brand new book, Under New Management, How Leading Organizations Are Upending Business as Usual, and I'm excited to have him here on the show. David, welcome to Read to Lead. Jeff, thank you so much. I'm excited to be on the show. Well, one of the things I really appreciated about the book, uh, just a a little side note here, is each chapter has that paragraph that kind of lays out what that chapter is going to accomplish, what argument that chapter is going to make. Uh, I wish more authors uh, and more books did that. 
You know, that's really funny that you say that because that was the second biggest fight with my editor in writing the book was, <laughs> you know, I kind of like to have that Gladwell-esque style where you just mm. jump into the story and then you got to figure it all out. And he was like, no, 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 readers hate that. And you're, I mean, you're proof of concept. That he, I mean, <laughs> I hate to say this, but he was right. So yeah, I lost that battle, but I guess I'm glad. <laughs> well, I'll say too, is as an interviewer, it was tempting to go to the beginning of each chapter and call my question from that paragraph without actually reading it. But I did did not do that. I actually read the book. So, uh, but other interviewers may benefit from that as they talk to you <laughs> leading up to oh, the release. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, well, first, uh, what was it you set out to accomplish uh, by writing uh, this book? What was what was the main goal? Well, uh, so I mean, there's that, Nick Morgan and, and Michael Port both have that line about you know if you're going to give a speech or you're going to write a book, you should try and change the world. So apart <laughs> from that, I mean, we'll go with that. I mean, the, the big <laughs> overarching one is change the world, but in in particular, sort of maybe change the world of work or what have you. Really, the mm-hmm. the motivation for the book came from my my previous book was called The Myths of Creativity, and it looked at a lot of misconceptions around the creativity and innovation and the things that individuals and leaders and teams need to kind of over come in order to tap into their creative side. And and when I was writing that, and then when I was running around for two years talking about it, people kept asking me questions about these really sort of funky policies that are in the book, like hackathons or 20% time at Google, which, you know, we're all kind of familiar with. Mm. And at the same time, I was watching all of these, you know, business insider and fast company articles about banning email or unlimited vacation or all of this other stuff. And, and the, the organizational psychologist in me, the professor had, uh, in me just kind of kept going crazy um, because most of these articles weren't seeing it through that lens. I mean, I think there's a larger shift at work here that we all talk about the shift from industrial work to knowledge work. And Daniel Pink did a great job a few years ago with Drive pointing out that that means the way we motivate people to work needs to change. Mm-hmm. But I think there's a lot of other things in the workplace that need to change too. Our whole system of management is built on a foundation that assumes routine industrial work and we're not there anymore. So mm-hmm. the really the, the goal in the book is to highlight all of these different practices and policies beyond just motivational ones that need to change if we're going to keep up with where the nature of work is going. Well, you hinted at, at one thing I want to ask about right off the bat. Uh, the last company I worked for, I, I did all I could to help try to steer us away from a, such a heavy reliance on, on email. And, and I, I want to get your perspective on this because uh, uh, David calls chapter one outlaw email. So what exactly, David, is wrong with email? Is it, is it not this awesome tool that allows us to get more done than we could otherwise or no? Uh, it depends. As a tool for getting things done, I'll tell you this, it's it's an amazing tool for feeling like we're getting <laughs> stuff done. You know, I'm sure you felt that sensation mm. and I do too. I mean, I, I actually kind of get physically agitated if it's 4.30, 5 o'clock-ish and I'm not at inbox zero, right? I have right. that mental tick to me and I can feel productive if I clean out my email inbox. But, mm. you know, h- how far have I actually moved the ball downfield? Not all that far. <laughs> all I've really done is punt, right? Mm. <laughs> it's a totally different <laughs> analogy. And what a lot of companies have found is that internally, internal communication, email is really the wrong tool for collaboration. You know, for, for starters, I mean, it, it's asynchronous, which is fine, but, and actually that's his biggest advantage. It's asynchronous, meaning you can't, you have, you don't have to have the conversation all at once, but because it's of the way it functions, conversations go every which way. I mean, we've all been on that CC chain that just never ends and people (laughs) chime in at just the wrong time, et cetera. And so if we're looking to have a tool for electronic communication, there are far better tools out there. And most companies are having to sort of take what's off the shelf and then kind of customize it to be a better internal collaboration tool. The other issue with email is that it doesn't shut off. I mean, it just does not shut off. And as as great as it is to marvel that we're in a 24-7 world, our bodies, our minds were not created to be always on. I mean, the reason we, when we stopped moving from factory work and into the office, the reason we didn't move into the office is that we still need a break every once in a while. And when we're at home, and we're staring at our phone and we're thinking about or responding to an email from our boss, we're not at home. We're still at work and we weren't sort of created to do that. And so a lot of companies are realizing that not only is it is it taking a toll on the other areas of our life, it's taking a toll on our work. We're dramatically less productive when we're always facing that need to respond to email. And so some companies deal with that in different ways. The, the favorite ones of mine that I profile in the book banned it entirely internally and just said, hey, there are other tools we can use and we're going to set them up and use those. So use email to interact with your customers 
customers, fine, but don't use it to interact internally. And then others have taken kind of less drastic steps and, and configured their servers so that they only send and receive email at certain times or shut down their servers entirely on nights and weekends, which is, which is awesome. I'm actually still trying to figure out how to do that in <laughs> Mac mail so that I can practice what I preach. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the, the point is that it's a wonderful tool, but the reasons that it's wonderful also take a toll. Right. And they take a toll on our minds and our bodies and our collaboration and they make us feel incredibly productive. But in some ways, we're really not. Yeah. Well, help us understand the concept of what you call in the book, achieving customer satisfaction through employee happiness, because I thought I understood kind of this whole employee first uh, mindset. But I realized uh, that I I didn't quite understand it as much as as I would like. Talk about the, the typical uh, company hierarchy, uh, you know, information travels top to bottom, accountability travels from, you know, from the front line to, to the senior level management, and, and why it's necessary to turn that upside down, basically. Yeah, so one of the things that I really wanted to dive into in underdue management was this is this is not a new concept. In fact, there's a great book literally called Employees First, Customers Second that that tracks one of the most famous um, executives who sort of turned the whole hierarchy upside down. And and on the on the surface level, you're exactly right. I think a lot of us know there's 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 a lot of research behind what's called the service profit chain, which basically says that one of the best predictors of profitability for a company is customer satisfaction, and that one of the best predictors of customer satisfaction is employee satisfaction or employee uh, happiness, as you said. Mm. But not a lot of us have really taken the time to delve into what does that mean? And you're exactly right. It means a turning around of the hierarchy. And so in the book, I look at um, Vignette Nair and HLC Technologies, which literally started, I, they say they flipped their hierarchy entirely. I like to think of it as actually they kind of laid it down on its side. But the idea is if you think of that top down, there's usually a few number of people at the top and then the bottom, the, usually in a hierarchy, the very bottom level is the one that actually interacts with a customer, right? But for almost every business, because almost every business is now in the service business, even if you're selling a product, that front line, that bottom tier of the hierarchy is Mm -hmm. where all of the value is created, Mm -hmm. right? And so what Nayir basically figured out was that in order to keep customers satisfied, they, everyone who was not on that front line needed to be accountable to the people who were on the front line. Because when employees needed something, they didn't call up the CEO, they called up their rep, they called up their person on the front line that they were interacting with. And so making those front line people now accountable to the employee and also accountable to everybody else in the organization, then you're really dividing their loyalty and not letting them put their customers first. And that's really what it comes down to is it's not, it's not necessarily about employees first. That's the no be all end all. That's a mm. huge misconception. It's really about putting the frontline employees first so that they can put the customer first in their work. But if they have to put their boss first, even above their customer, they're not going to do the things they need to do to create satisfied customers. Well, David goes on to say that, that many leaders are beginning to question why in, in offices that do not track hours worked, they need to track days not worked. <laughs> So in, in, in other words, it might be time to, to lose that standard vacation policy. I loved this chapter, David. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, this was one of my favorite ones to write, mostly because there's, there's a lot of debate about this right now. And it's really funny to me because the debate is actually over whether or not in these unlimited vacation or, or what I like to call the vacation non-policy, right? Meaning there is no policy. Whether or not people take enough breaks, whether or not they take too little, et cetera. And to me, those all sort of miss the point. The point is exactly what you said. In most offices today, most knowledge work organizations today, we don't track hours in and hours out. There's not a punch card. You're not hitting the clock. You come in and we all come in around the same time. We all leave around the same time. But it's understood that if you want to come in a little bit earlier or you want to come a little bit later and work a little bit later, that's all that's all fine. We don't track that. Right. There's no one watching that. Mm. And so if we're if we don't actually have a record of when people are on, why do we need a record of when they were off? Right. I mean, in the days of running a factory, we did because we needed to make sure that every that there were enough people to keep the factory running. If everybody took off at the same time, there'd be chaos. But again, it comes down to not necessarily hours worked or hours not worked. It comes down to me to an issue of trust. So we're basically saying we trust you enough to not track your hours day to day, but we don't trust you enough to figure out when you're going to go on vacation. That has to get approved. That has to meet a minimum number. We trust you to do your work, but we we don't really trust you to do your work because we're also demanding that you commit to being around a certain number of days per year, which to a lot of organizations just started, it didn't make any sense. And, and Netflix is probably the biggest example of this one. They weren't the first to go to an unlimited policy, but they were probably the most famous mm. uh, transition to an unlimited policy. And 
again, that spurred this argument of are people taking the right number of days off under these policies or not? It's not about that. It's about trust. It's about the organization saying we trust you to get your work done and to be able to know how much rest you need in order to effectively get your work done. And I think it's telling that after Netflix implemented that unlimited vacation policy, the very next thing that they did, building off of the success of that trust-based vacation policy, was create a trust-based expense report policy. Mm. Their expense policy is now five words long, act in Netflix's best interest. Mm. Meaning, you know, we don't have to get it approved where you're going to stay or where you're going to fly, whatever. We just trust you. If you take advantage of our trust, we'll deal with that one person and, and invite them to be untrustworthy at some other organization. But uh, if you if you can live up to it and be trustworthy, there's no reason not to extend that trust to you first. You're an adult. We should treat you like an adult. Now, this is probably as good a time as any uh, to suggest that if if you don't buy this book for yourself, buy it and give it anonymously to your HR director. <laughs> oh, no, totally. If, and if you want to do that, if you want to send it to your boss or you want to send it to your HR director, yeah, buy a copy. Send me your receipt, David at DavidBurgers.com. I'll write them a letter and you can tuck it into the book and say like <laughs> someone in your organization organization thinks that this is really important. And so they wanted mm. to give you a copy of this. I'll, I'll do it. I, I'll, I'm going to write up a template letter anyway for that reason. I'll take it. I'll take it on me. So you can <laughs> leave it anonymously and I'll even put my name to it. I love it. I love it. Well, paying people to quit is is something that I think most know uh, uh, from Zappos. It's, they're pretty well known for that. Explain the concept, though, for those that may not know it uh, and, and share some reasons, David, why uh, some companies actually might want to consider doing the same. So I, I think almost every company might want to consider doing this. And it's, and it's not for the reasons we might think. You know, Zappos mm-hmm. got really famous with this idea because, you know, it, on the surface, it makes sense, right? Oh, you, you don't want to be here. We'll make it easier for you to leave here. If you don't think you're a cultural fit, you don't think you're a performance fit, we'll make it kind of easier for you to leave, which I think is hugely important. There's a lot of people who know that they are not a fit in the organization, know that they're not performing up to speed, but are scared of those few weeks or months of unemployment. So they still stay in an organization that's not a good fit. And Zappos mm. basically says like, we'll pay your unemployment even if you quit because we want you to be happy and we want the people who stay here to be committed. So that's on one level that it works, but it, it, I've actually dived into some research and under new management that it works at a whole other level, which is it works on the people that turn down the offer that decide not to quit. So we, we all are sort of afflicted, not afflicted, but it's a, it's a cognitive thing that we do to feel better about ourselves called confirmation bias. We mm. selectively filter in or filter out information that confirms what we already believe. And so if I offer you a stack of money to quit and then you turn it down, your confirmation bias starts going to work and going, well, obviously I love this place because, you know, I got 4000 or $5,000 to quit and I didn't take it. So you begin to sort of even unconsciously look for reasons to stay more engaged. And, so, and I think that's really the best deal of paying people to quit because you don't actually have to pay the money and you still benefit from more engaged employees just because you ask them to make that decision. And it's one of the reasons when, when Zappos, which as you said, was the most famous one to, to do it. When Zappos mm-hmm. was purchased by Amazon, this policy actually transferred over. And for some employees at amazon.com now, they actually get an annual offer every single year. Mm-hmm. They get an offer that says, are you still happy? Do you still want to work here? If not, we'll pay you to quit. And every year for the first five years, they actually up the ante a thousand dollars every year up to five thousand dollars every year Mm. to go you know if you're not happy we'll help you find somewhere else to go by paying your bills for as long as you can make five grand last well i want to talk about the topic too of salary secrecy this is something that when i was in working in the traditional workforce i never understood david but i could never quite either put my finger on how to fix it or, or what was wrong with it. I'm curious to know, uh, especially since it's, it's the cultural norm here in the U.S., what, what, is, what does the research say? How, how can sharing salaries openly actually increase productivity? Yeah, so you're you're absolutely right. This is I, I'm anticipating this is the most controversial chapter in, in the book because I'm already I gave a TEDx talk on this too, and I'm already kind of getting I'm getting emails from both sides on this right already, and mm-hmm. and most of them are in line with the research. Most of them are supportive, and, and the research there's a, a decades old theory, empirically based theory called equity theory, that basically says that all of us cognitively in the workplace are always running a ratio in our mind between our inputs and our outputs, how hard we're working and how much we're getting paid, right? And so if if David, if I think that I'm working at a 10 and I'm getting paid at a 10, Right. And I look mm-hmm. across the, the cubicle or through through the glass door of your office and I look at Jeff and Jeff's working a 15 and Jeff's getting paid a 15. We have no problem. It's equitable. It's not equal, mm-hmm. but it's equitable. It's 
it's in that same ratio. But if I look through that office and I see you playing solitaire and I start thinking, Jeff's working at a seven and he gets paid a 15, <laughs> I'm mad. I'm very mad, right? And I'll take that anger out in a couple different ways. I'll either re- reduce my performance, I'll start slacking off until I feel like I'm getting paid equitably, which if I'm using this analogy, I'm trying to do math on the fly, now I'm gonna take it down to probably a five or a six in order to make feel good about getting paid at a 10, mm. right? Or I'll look for somewhere else. I'll just decide to leave the organization and look for a place that's more fair. And so the interesting that compounds this is that there's a ton of research showing we're terrible at guessing each other's salaries. (laughs) We're just awful at it, right? We consistently overestimate the salaries of people that are paid below us in the hierarchy. And we're, we underestimate the salaries of people paid above us, which I always thought was really interesting. Apart from the CEO, we actually feel like that the people who are doing all that work above us aren't all that fairly compensated. So what's the point in moving up the hierarchy if, if they own me, but they don't actually pay me all that much more, right? Mm. And the truth is, because we're terrible at it and because we're always running that ratio, we're kind of always dissatisfied. And this is why people talk about it. And this is why when somebody leaves a pay stub on the photocopier, everybody (laughs) goes crazy, right? So we're always looking at it. And the only solution is openness. If you have a fair pay policy, which I would say that most organizations actually do have a relatively fair system for setting pay, we just assume they don't because we don't know what it is. You know, and so if it is fair, if it's not fair, obviously you got to fix that first. But if it is fair, opening it up does a lot more good than it does harm, right? And I realize that for some people, it's a little bit uncomfortable letting people know what you make because there's kind of a, a cultural thing there where you're not supposed to. But is it is it more uncomfortable than always wondering if you're underpaid or always wondering if you're discriminated against or things like that? Like it, it to me, it's it's far more fair if we're just kind of open about it. And mm. now the interesting thing about this legally too is that a lot of people come at it from the, oh, I'm not allowed to talk about it. You know, when you worked in a, <laughs> in a traditional organization, they probably did. The majority of American companies have a policy forbidding it. Yeah. Those policies, and, and I'm not a legal expert, but I've done a lot of research in this thing, so this is not legal advice. Those policies are generally illegal. They generally violate the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. Now, mm. again, it varies by your situation. Not a lawyer, not giving legal advice. But in most cases, if you're ever reprimanded for talking about salary, you've got a pretty strong case that they actually violated your protected right to talk about your salary. Mm. And then there are those times when the new guy who works in the office next to yours doesn't realize yet how thin the walls are and is talking to (laughs) his friend on the phone about what he's getting paid and you're upset by it because it's more than what you're getting paid. (laughs) Right. Yeah. No. And and again, in a secrecy condition, you have no recourse, right? Let's say you guys are peers. You're, you're equally qualified. You, you, you have about the same amount of experience. You have similar degrees. You have no recourse because you're not supposed to know. Exactly. Right. But I talked to a ton of different companies in an openness and a tr- in a pay transparency culture. In fact, even one, um, I talked to Sumwall, which is a social media analytics firm, and they gave me an actual example of an engineer who was interviewing a new engineer that they wanted to hire. And when he found out from the HR people what he was going to be offered, what the new hire was going to be offered, he he goes, well, that's not what I'm making. And I have two years more experience than him. <laughs> right? and, and he could actually have a productive conversation and ended up getting a raise because mm-hmm. they were, they said, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's not fair. So we'll we'll change it. But again, if it were a, a secrecy condition, you'd have absolutely no recourse. Well, what if, uh, David, total transparency isn't feasible right now? What are some other steps that organizations or companies can take? So I think every almost every organization, short of maybe Buffer, which posts all their salaries on the Internet, which actually I don't know that I recommend. <laughs> I think almost every company can get a little bit more transparent. My recommendation is you don't necessarily have to publish everybody's salary, but most companies do use some kind of uniform formula for calculating pay. So what is the position or what tier is it in the hierarchy or mm. you know that type of a thing? Letting that information be public can be hugely helpful. And, and I mean, if somebody wants to guesstimate and figure out, oh, what does Jeff make because he's got this degree and he's worked here that long and plug variables into the formula, great. But even just sending the message that, hey, pay here is not based on some horse trading scheme or negotiating thing and people aren't overpaid or underpaid. Here's what we use to calculate everybody's salary. And if mm. if you've got a problem with the formula, we can talk about it. But just so you know, we're all paid along this uniform uh, formula. So there's a 
a uniform spectrum, a fair spectrum Mm -hmm. of pay, even that can have huge steps in reducing people's feeling that they're underpaid or being discriminated against, et cetera. So you don't necessarily have to post everybody's salary, like name and then pay right next to it. Although some companies do and they see great results, but I think everybody should at least be more transparent in in how they decide who gets paid what, because I think you can reap a lot of the benefits of transparency, even without full transparency. Well, let's talk about that thing that everybody loves to go through, that thing called the annual performance review. I, I can remember David being so entrenched in the culture that I uh, at one point was convinced that I was so fortunate to work for a company that required these year in and year out. So why are they more and more getting a failing grade, as, as you say in the book? <laughs> yeah. So, or, or my other favorite quote that is in the book, and this resonates with me because when I, when I first came out of school, I was in the pharmaceutical industry, is that if they were a drug, they would never get FDA approval because there's too many side effects and not enough <laughs> efficacy, right? But yeah, they, they're getting a failing grade. And it, it comes down to two elements, feedback and then the actual sort of rating system, right? Mm-hmm. And feedback, this is actually why I, I like performance reviews. I, I mean, especially when I was younger, I looked forward to performance reviews because I legitimately wanted to know how to improve. Mm-hmm. The problem is then I sat in on my first one and I'm sure it was sort of like your, your first couple ones where you're just hugely disappointed because they're talking about stuff that happened nine months ago that you have no, no ability to change anymore, mm, right? Right. So the feedback just doesn't happen often enough. Even companies, like, and this is rare, but even companies that do a, a every six months or every, a quarterly performance review session, these are still kind of in a lot of cases not often enough conversation. And actually, when you make them more frequent, but they're still formal, you kind of ruin any informal feedback discussion that might actually be happening because that performance review is always around the corner. The other thing that's wrong with them is the rating system. You know, most of them, I'm sure yours worked similar as mine, is you walk away with either one overall rating exceeds performance, meets expectations, Mm. underperformer, whatever, or you walked away with like an individual rating in four or five different categories. Or both. Or both, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And somehow you had to figure out how they were weighted because, you know, you got more exceeds, but somehow you were still meets or something like that. And the problem is that in in a feedback oriented conversation, when you have that label, the actual feedback and how to improve performance conversation shuts down once someone knows what the label is. Mm. In other words, as soon as I tell you, Jeff, you know, Jeff, you did great. You worked really hard. You meet our, our expectations. All that's going on in your mind is why aren't I exceeds? What? <laughs> and the rest of the conversation is you almost trying to change their mind, right? Instead right. of having a conversation about expectations, about feedback, about future goals, and all of the good things that are supposed to come out of this conversation, we focused on the rating. And the reason, by the way, that, that you could have four or five of those ratings and exceeds and still be meets is because one of the other um, consistent elements of most performance rating systems is stack ranking, is the idea that there has to be somebody who is first and there has to be somebody who's second. And usually it has to follow a normative distribution, right? So it has to mm-hmm. be that inverted U that we're all used to, which, which, by the way, the stats nerd in me has always had a problem with because – if you have a company that follows a normative distribution in performance, then your company is representative of the population as a whole. And that means your hiring process is broken because you're not hiring good people. Right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, right. but we, we make it we make it conform to that system. And so almost everybody except the top person is going to be disappointed. And that top person probably going to be disappointed next year when somebody else gets a turn at the top. Right. And so again, it comes down to just arguments about who's getting rated where instead of productive conversations. And so it's not that the companies that scrapped the annual performance review just did away with all feedback entirely. They just realized that what what managers really needed was some advice on how to coach people to give them constant feedback and help them perform better at all times so that they could have informal conversations about feedback, expectations, growth and development, those sort of things that dramatically helped people's performance. But making them fill out a form every year or every six months or every quarter wasn't teaching them how to coach their team. Teaching them how to coach their team is teaching them how to coach their team. And as a manager, I just remember also fondly dreading having to go through and and prepare all of those evaluations. I mean, it's just productivity drops and that's all you're thinking about for a solid month. And it's, it's crazy. Oh yeah. 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 And one of my, one of my favorite examples actually is in Adobe uh, post performance review. They saw an increase in voluntary departures, Mm. 
right? But then for the rest of the year, it was sort of artificially low. In other words, the underperformers who needed to quit would wait until the performance review and then figure out they should quit. <laughs> when you do away with it, it kind of spreads out. And as soon as somebody realizes they're not a fit, they decide mm. they should go look for a job somewhere else. Mm, that's interesting. Well, the, the concept of an open office environment has been popular in recent years. And in some cities, you know, Nashville, where I'm at, is one of them. Co-working spaces are kind of all the rage. Uh, But David says the advantages can often be offset by a number of distractions and that the best leaders have a different answer to open versus closed office debate. So, So what are some of those? Yeah, so this is actually funny because, you know, like you said, co-working spaces are all the rage. Most uh, two, about two days a week, I'm actually hiding in a co-working space <laughs> that has an open office floor plan when I'm not at my office in the university. Right. For, and for the reason, basically, that the research ha- has supported. I mean, we there's a lot of interesting research on the benefits of an open office that there's in, increased collaboration and right. and in, increased serendipity, so you get all of these bright ideas. And while those things are true, the benefits are not offset by a lot of the costs. Interestingly enough, in an open office floor plan, people are more likely to uh, show to, to show up uh, for work late. They're more likely to skip work. They're actually more likely to be legitimately sick or at least to claim more or more sick days. Mm. They're more likely to experience stress because they're never actually able to sort of tune it out, right? I mean, it's interesting. Most of the time when we talk about introverts and extroverts, we talk about that like categories, right? Just like open and closed offices as categories. And so you'd think that like extroverts would love working in an open office. And of course, introverts would, would hate it because it's, it's wide open. Well, people actually exist on a spectrum, right? Of how much, uh, o- how open or closed they are in terms of introversion and extroversion. And every one of us is in that sort of point along a spectrum. And so the best offices actually do resemble that spectrum. Mm. They provide openness, but they also provide closeness. They provide, I, the term that I like the best is a palette of places, meaning multiple different places where people can work throughout the day. So instead of chaining them down to kind of one office, they may have a desk in an open office space, but have the option of reserving a corral where if they need to do deep work and be focused, they can do that. Some offices are putting in, you know, little coffee bars or things like that. So you can have an open office, but then it's a place where it's open, but it's very inviting to conversation. Whereas a traditional open office might still be, you know, limiting to conversation. So it's really the idea of running that range and creating an office that is that entire spectrum of places. And that's, this is actually one of the cool things that I learned essentially after writing this chapter in the book is I went out and I got a membership at a co-working space because most of the time I work in an office with maybe the door is open most of the time if I'm doing deep work, it's closed. But I all kind of felt like I needed a pallet of places and my university didn't have one. So I kind of created it by having multiple options for me. Mm. So, you know, I think that's an interesting lesson that if you can't convince your boss to change your entire working space, maybe there's another place that you could camp down and do a few hours a week to get that. Maybe it's because it's op- it's extra closed or maybe it's because it's more open than what your office has now. But really creating for yourself a pallet of different places that you can work. Well, David, I want to get to some questions that uh, that aren't directly related to the book. But before I do that, uh, is there anything you want to make sure we cover from the four or five chapters we haven't dove into just yet? Yeah, I guess not necessarily from the chapters that we haven't covered, but overarchingly, I, I kind of, I know what people are thinking. I've been talking about these ideas long enough that there are, there are two types of people that listen to a lot of these ideas. The first are like, yeah, that's great. We should totally do that. And the second are, well, that'll never work. And what we're doing now works, et cetera. And when I think about those people, I think about two things. I think about a quote from Dane Atkinson of some all who I interviewed, who said that great leaders don't innovate products. They innovate the factory, meaning they innovate the workplace, which is what these policies are trying to do. Innovate the workplace. And the other thing I think about is the internal combustion engine. Like, so you don't have to be a car nerd, but I I talked to a couple engineers on this and the internal combustion engine is only about 30% efficient, meaning 30% of the energy that's stored in gasoline actually gets put into forward motion. And I think this is interesting because, you know, at least according to Gallup, we're actually doing less than that when it comes to mental energy. Right. Because the engagement rates hover around two out of 10 people or 20 percent. So 20 percent of the mental energy that people bring to work actually gets spent on work. (laughs) And the only way that we change. So if we define the old policies as working, it's sort of like saying, yes, a car works. And yes, it does. Mm. But thank goodness there are people like uh, Elon Musk. Right. Or Dane Atkinson of Sumall, who's the Elon Musk of workplaces. Right. 
who are always wanting to kind of tinker and experiment and try and reinvent and try and move that needle up. And I'm, I'm not an idealist. I don't know that we'll ever get to 100% engagement according to Gallup, but I think a lot of these policies have the potential to raise that number, maybe to 40%, maybe 50%, maybe 60%. And if we do that, that's huge. That's mm -hmm. a huge impact on the world of work and also just on how satisfied we are with the work that we do every day. So it's, I know these things to some people might sound amazing and to other people might sound crazy, but to the people who they sound crazy, it's because they're experiments and we need these experiments to move forward. So even if you say it's not for you, I'd encourage you try it. Maybe it is. Maybe it moves the needle. Or maybe it encourages you to take another experiment that you wouldn't have thought of till you tried these first ones. Well, you mentioned uh, Dan Pink earlier. So one of his books might be the answer to this question. But I'd love it if you could name for us a book or two over the last couple of years, David, that uh, that you uh, kind of go back to again and again. Some of your favorites from the from the recent past. OK, so, you know, one of them actually is, but it's not the one you're thinking of. Um I'm a huge, probably the most, the book that I most often give out to people is Dan Pink's The Adventures of Johnny Bunko. Have you read The Adventures of Johnny Bunko? I have not. I, I'm, I'm aware of it, but I have I'm not read it. Mail, I'm going to have to mail you a copy, Jeff. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, he got this idea after he wrote A Whole New Mind to write a graphic novel, or technically, the technical term is manga style comic mm. that teaches the rules of career advice. Right. And so it's this perfect book for like anybody that's 18 to, to probably even 30 on things to think about when you're thinking about your career. But it reads really easily because it's literally a graphic novel, not just sort of like a normal book. And, mm. you know, my, my favorite rule number one of the six rules in the adventures of Johnny Bunko is that there is no plan. If you think that there's a master plan for advancing your career, you're wrong. There's no master plan. There's there's preparation and there's luck and luck favors those who are prepared. So mm. all there is is kind of investing in yourself and then chasing serendipity and chasing interests. And you'll find yourself in places you never even thought you would be in. Mm. Um, and so so Johnny Bunko is definitely one of those. The other one is probably um, Roger Martin, who's sort of my other intellectual hero has this great book called The Opposable Mind, which is kind of a 200 word expose of that George Bernard Shaw quote that intelligence is the ability to hold two conflicting thoughts in your mind at the same time. And he profiles leaders who are able to do that either two conflicting business models or two conflicting ways of looking at the world or two conflicting strategies. And they're able to kind of reconcile them in ways that really create genius. So it's really kind of interesting because one is sort of super text heavy and intellectual, the opposable mind, and the other is a comic book. But together, they are genius. Mm. Well, as you all know, I'm a big believer that intentional and consistent reading is one of the keys to success in business and in life. But just as much as I believe that, I also believe that the ability to effectively share your ideas in public goes a long way uh, toward uh, success. And that's something you've obviously got a lot of experience at, having delivered TEDx talks and, and, and others, uh, keynotes for, for, I think, Google and, and Microsoft among them. So I'd be curious to know, David, what some of your tips would be for delivering a, a memorable and impactful public talk? So um, a practical and then kind of a motivational. The, the practical would be take an improv class or take an acting class. Um, mm. I grew up, my sister actually went to college for musical theater and now runs a theater in Washington, D.C. And sort of, I, she's my older sister. So I always grew up kind of watching her. And then in middle school and high school and even elementary school, I was in theater because she was, right? So it was like, she's going to be the star of the show and you're going to be in the, in the chorus, right? Mm. But I learned a lot and I learned a lot about performance. And it wasn't until actually Michael Port, who has been a past guest on this show, I know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until reading uh, reading a lot of his work or, or listening to a lot of his talks and his podcasts, et cetera, that I kind of, it clicked in me that one of the reasons why I've been able to kind of do what I do is because of that acting training. And so I encourage people, if you're at uh, Toastmasters is great, but pair Toastmasters with an improv class and you mm -hmm. have a winning combination. And then mm -hmm. the second one is a bit more motivational, which is, uh, I think it was, I was listening to an interview one time with Simon Sinek, who is obviously, you know, is an uh, incredible presenter. And, uh, he always said that he, the last thing he sort of says to himself before he goes on stage is you're here to give. And I think especially when you get to the point where you're giving paid talks, it's really that anytime you're giving talks, it's really easy to think like I'm here to to tell them my message. I'm here to convince them of this thing or whatever. But taking a second and really just kind of reminding yourself, here's an audience that doesn't know what I have to say. I can only give them what I'm about to give them informationally on stage. What am I here to give them? Because that's the goal I'm here to give. 
Um, and so I try and do something similar and just remind myself, I don't do it right before I go on stage. Cause usually right before I go on stage, I'm kind of like panicking and making sure my shirt is tucked <laughs> in and all that sort of stuff. But as I'm prepping for the day, I'm always thinking about what is the goal? What am I trying to give to these people in order that they have something useful to take away? It reminds me of the first sentence in a book called The Purpose Driven Life. It's not about you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Exactly. Well, it may be premature to ask this, but uh, uh, I always like to ask, uh, what's next uh, on the horizon for you? What are you and your team working on now that, that you're excited about? It, it can be book related. It can be a uh, course, something you're working on. What might that be? Yeah. So um, it's kind of funny that you said, what are you and your team? I've actually been fascinated in writing the previous two books with um, networks, with social networks mm-hmm. and how they form. And there's a there's a whole chapter in the new book about what I call writing the org chart in pencil, which means looking at your organization more as a network than as kind of a formal hierarchy. And I, I kind of have a, a networked team, right? I, I employ absolutely no one, but I have people that I would consider to be on my team because I'm sort of part of this network of people from, from marketing coaches to speaking coaches to all of these different people that are helping me. And so that got me thinking about like, huh, there's something to this. And so that's kind of where I've been reading researching and where I've been mm-hmm. writing, something might come out of that. It might not, who knows? Um, but I've been, I've, I figure I've written about social network science for two in, in two different books. I should probably look at it a little bit deeper. <laughs> well, what's the best way to connect, uh, with you for folks that want to, uh, to say, Hey, or to, uh, to let you know what they think about the book. Yeah. So, um, the best way I've got a really awkward name, David Burkus, B-U-R-K-U-S. And so if you type that into Google, you'll find me, or if you type in davidburkus.com, you'll find me, find info about the book, the podcast, Radio Free Leader, and also some really cool resources based off of either of my books that you don't even have to buy the book to get. They're just free for you. So if you don't even, if you're unconvinced, you don't want to read the book now, or, or hopefully you pre-order the book and you're just waiting for Mr. Amazon to deliver it, uh, in a, in a couple days, et cetera, you can still get started with a bunch of cool resources that are on David Burkus. Com. And I, I did not realize until uh, prepping for this for this time together that uh, your podcast is an award winning podcast. So congratulations. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. No, thank you. I, that really just means that I spend enough time submitting it to all sorts of different, <laughs> different things. But thank you. No, I mean, it all, to me, it all actually started with the podcast. I, mm. before I even had a book, I, I started a podcast and I started blogging on other people's sites and, uh, you know, I owe everything to the Radio Free Leader podcast mm. and to read the lead podcast for helping me <laughs> talk about the new book. I owe that too. Well, you, if you want an award, you, that's more than I can say for this podcast. <laughs> You're doing pretty I good. The, I would actually love the Jeff Brown award award of excellence. So if that is such a thing, <laughs> we will make it one and you'll be the first recipient. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much uh, for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, loved the book, uh, getting a lot out of it still. And I'm so glad you wrote it. And, and we've had the chance here to chat. It was a real treat. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm including links to the books that David mentioned and ways to get in touch with him, including LinkedIn and Twitter, should you like to connect with David. I had a chance to have dinner with him a few months ago and really enjoyed getting to know him. I think his book will be a great investment for you and your company. And don't be afraid to take David up on that offer to include a personal note from him if you decide you want to share a copy of the book with someone in your office. I can't begin to tell you how valuable a tool the online accounting software FreshBooks has been for me and my business the last seven years. Thrilled to have them as a sponsor of the show. And don't forget they're offering a free month of unrestricted use, totally free right now, and you don't need a credit card to take advantage of that free one-month trial. To claim your free month, just go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. One more time, that's freshbooks.com slash Slash read to lead. I want to say thanks to Stewart Coaching for a five star rating and review. And iTunes says he's got only one problem with the podcast. Jeff picks books and authors that I'm fascinated by, and I end up buying them all. My apologies. If you'd like to leave a rating and review on iTunes, just go to read to lead podcast.com slash iTunes. You can also do that in Stitcher, read to lead podcast.com slash Stitcher. Next time on the show, we'll welcome Success Magazine's leadership editor, John Addison, as we talk about his book, Real Leadership, Nine Simple Practices for Leading and Living with Purpose. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. 